So, Kevin, it's so great to see you. I just want to introduce you. Uh, Kevin Limbo is our Connecticut Comptroller, and I think that this is an incredibly important conversation, especially on the heels of our conversation last week with our State Treasurer, Sean Wooden, because um, I, as we've done these, I do like to do a little bit of civics, because I think there are a lot of people who you know, fill out the ballot. It's been a long time for a lot of us since high school or even middle school civics and remembering what everybody's job is. So um, I, I am so excited that you're here tonight and I thank you so much for being here. And when you're ready, I'd love to hear from you what your job entails. That's great. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for in the invitation to be with you and I hope things are going well. I'm very excited about your candidacy and would love to see thanks. you uh, in the house when we go back. Uh, so the comptroller, uh, I, I joke that uh, no one really knows you have a comptroller, um, <laughs> and, and I won't take up a lot of time, but at, at the end of my first term, we went out and did a quick poll to see, like, what do people think about how I'm doing? And we thought we had done a, an amazing job in our first year, hit the ground running, got a lot of good things done, and we found out pretty quickly, not only did they not know who I was, but they didn't know who the comptroller, that we even had a comptroller. So um, okay. it's a little freeing on some level, but uh, for the civics lesson, uh, we do have six uh, statewide constitutional offices in Connecticut. They include the governor and lieutenant governor, obviously, the treasurer, who uh, you spoke to uh, last week, the secretary of state, Denise Merrill, the comptroller, me, uh, and the attorney general, uh, William Tong. Um, and we go in order. So I'm number five. Uh, the governor is number one, and the attorney general is number six. Uh, that's not our order of succession. So five people don't need to get hit by a bus before I get to be the governor. It doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> it's really all about our when we appeared in the state constitution. Um, and my job as comptroller is on the easy side to pay the state's bills, to maintain the books, to make sure the employees get paid, all of that sort of behind the scenes, under the stairs work that needs to get done. But then I also uh, facilitate and run the uh, retirement system uh, for state and retirees and municipal retirees in some cases. And I run what is the largest uh, private healthcare group uh, in the state. Um, and that is for, again, state employees and their families, municipal employees, some in their families. So we're about a quarter of a million lives that I'm buying healthcare for. Yeah which is so critical. And that was one of the things that I definitely wanted to talk. That was a great segue because, you know, COVID has really illustrated all of the, both the costs and the importance of healthcare. And we've seen at the federal level, the need, you know, the, the desire to roll back uh, what, you know, the nicknamed Obamacare. And it's just, you know, more than ever, you know, it's so interesting when you look at other countries where healthcare doesn't travel from job to job, and in this country, it does travel with you from job to job, hopefully. Um, you know, many people do not have that, which shouldn't be a luxury, but is often a luxury. Um, and so I would just love for you, I, I, had a, I remember so clearly we, we talked about prescription costs, we talked about healthcare costs in 2018, um, and some of the work that you were doing towards that, and I know some of it has changed since 2018, and I know there's still so much to go. So I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, so uh, it's clear, um, and I think you make a really important point, that COVID has sort of laid bare um, the, the inequities, the unfairness um, in the underlying healthcare system. Um, and it's not a question of like, uh, do you have an insurance card or do you not? But thinking about that insurance card as the ticket to healthcare, right? This is the ticket that gets you on the healthcare ride. And if you don't have one, chances are you're not getting on. Or, or you're getting on at a time that it's sort of too late to do something about a condition that might have been caught early and might have mm -hmm. saved your life in some cases. Right. So when you look at what people are doing uh, in, uh, in the context of COVID, um, you know, those of us who have insurance were very uh, happy and able to call our primary care provider and check in and say, I've got this symptom. What do you think? Do I need a test? If you don't have a primary care provider because you don't have insurance, mm -hmm. what do you do? You sort of hang out, you maybe go to, you know, a free testing site. And no matter what happens when you get that result, what do you do, right? There's no right. one there to monitor and follow your care. Um, so if there was ever a time that we need to rationalize our healthcare system to do something smarter uh, about the way we deliver healthcare, um, the time is now. Um, but we've proven, not only as residents of Connecticut, but as Americans, that we forget really quickly. I don't know if it's like, like childbirth memory, you know, child pain. Of yes. Memory. Like, so, because if you had one and you actually remembered how bad it was, you never would have a second one. Like, yes, and I clearly, clearly had amnesia <laughs> with three. <laughs> 
<laughs> but we forget about that stuff, yeah. right? And so then it goes yes. back to business as usual. We cannot allow that to occur. No. I buy, as I said earlier, healthcare for a quarter of a million people. We do it with an administrative load of about 1% compared to the private sector where it's 15, 18, 20% or more. I mean, because they have to pay high paid executives, they have to do a whole bunch of things that we don't do. And more importantly, we're actually delivering a healthcare system, not a sick care system. So we're putting a lot of resources toward catching things before they become problems and making sure our diabetics are doing what they need to do or folks who might be you know carrying around some extra weight have the resources they need to to take care of that um so i'm proud of the work that we're doing um but when i look around i see a lot of folks just don't have access to what we have and we could deliver it to them in a competitive space as a public option um but it's just getting the law passed um, right. And it's a difficult thing. There's a lobby, as you know, that's very strong right. against this. Well, and it's, you know, it does, you're right. I, I really do believe it does take the will. I mean, just in my own family, I can tell you that my sister lives in Pennsylvania with her husband and he is um, someone who is, you know, he does some carpentry work. He does, you know, he lays floors with, you know, as a fam part of a family business. And he just found out this week that he was exposed and she was on Twitter and said, you know, great, he's been exposed. We don't have health insurance. Now I have to figure out where he can go and where he can get a test. And this is the reality for families across the country. And it's, you know, and, and it's not everybody can get a test. That is not the case. There you know, the delays are real, um, even just for my own college student, and we do have health insurance, you know, navigating the what the college requires in terms of a COVID test and what the cost is, and they want it from a specific lab and, you know, all of those things. I mean, you think about, you know, even people who work in healthcare, these are such, you know, in interesting, challenging times. But I also think that, you know, Connecticut has always been known as the insurance capital, right? We've we, you know, that is what we've been known for. And so how do we balance that? You know, obviously we are a capitalistic society. We want people to be able to, you know, make money, but how do we balance that with this idea of the public option, even, even in our own state? You know, that's, yeah. it's, so, it's very so look, we're not, we're not talking, we're not talking about free insurance, right? We're not talking about a, right. uh, uh, a social program that just lets everyone come on and do, with no uh, need to pay. Uh, we are talking about a public option among other options for people to choose right. from. Um, and, you know, the private market drives on competition or they're supposed to, right? We learn in right. business school or we learn when we're taking our business classes that, you know, it's about cost and quality, cost and quality. This market is not a market. It's, it's, right. it's a captive. You, you only have one, two, three options. The, the quality is whatever it is and they're not competing because they sort of set yeah prices and they have price behind the way there's no way to find a really competitive well-placed um uh, advantage so i would argue and i've said this publicly that if we stand for public option and we don't expand the number of people who have coverage meaning we just cannibalize the existing book of business the people who already have coverage elsewhere just gravitate to us this will not be a success. It's a failure sure. at that point. We may have given price relief to those individuals and their families, but we're really trying to get to that larger group of people who are not eligible for subsidies on the exchange, for example, mm -hmm. make just too much to get there, um, but still can't afford a meaningful private policy um, and not right. one that carries with it a, you know, a $5,000 deductible before they ever touch right. their coverage. I mean, that's just not meaningful. That's catastrophic coverage. It, it's made to protect you against financial loss. It's not about healthcare delivery. Well, and, and we still see medical bankruptcies. We still see a significant number of medical bankruptcies. I mean, it's highly concerning. And then like you brought up before, people with diabetes, people with obesity. I mean, definitely, you know, and all the physician friends that I know, the epidemiologists that I know, and, and I have to say, the people that I've been talking to are that are in a variety of roles in public health, you know, obesity is a huge thing right now with COVID. I mean, I, I had a friend who that was her only comorbidity and she nearly lost her life. And there are other people who are frankly losing their lives because because that is their only comorbidity. It's not that they have something underlying that they didn't know about. It's not that they have something else underlying that they did know about. And so I think that in terms of having an insurance program that like our own insurance program that'll say, 
you know, we'll give you a discount if you join a gym or we'll, you know, we'll work with you on a gym membership or, you know, these, these sorts of preventative measures that we could really be using as both preventative and educational measures. You know, that, that's what, you know, in terms of the public option, I think that there are a lot of things there that you've talked about. And especially, um, I just know from our own family, again, with prescription costs, and I know that there are a lot of families, whether it's an EpiPen or it's an uh, ADD medicine or it's other life-saving medications, it is critical that we do something about prescriptions. I know um, you had done with Michelle, Re Representative Michelle Cook a couple years ago. It was a great forum on prescription costs. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. It's a, a, thanks. It's a constant battle um, to try to figure out how, how can the state leverage our existing purchasing power to make a difference in the lives of people who can't afford the medications. Right. Um, and we buy a lot of healthcare and a lot of prescription drugs. And I have at my disposal the best tools uh, to be able to actually leverage and negotiate. And um, we get into risk sharing arrangements with some of the big pharmaceutical companies because they say, look, this drug, you know, the wonder drug that does wonders, right? This thing is going to save you a lot of money and save your people heartache. And I'm like, well, prove it. Right. So prescribe it for our folks. And after a year, we'll sort of of see where we are and if it does what it's you said it was going to do we will pay you the full face value and if not we won't right and those who are competent they should want to get into those kinds of arrangements and they also love bypassing the again the insurance structure right the pharmacy benefit manager structure because i'm a big enough purchaser that they want to contract directly so that's great for the people that i cover it's great for every state rep and state senator, you know, who sits up at the Capitol, some who vote no on trying to make a difference in this area um, because they're afraid of the lobbyists that are darkening their doors or whatever it is that motivates them. There's always a balance in all of this stuff. And you know, th that's just baked in uh, to what we do. So it's pretty exciting. We went out to a request for proposal, an RFP process recently for the plan that I run for pharmacy. And we put the pharmacy benefit managers in competition with one another. Oh, wow. And we had what we call a reverse auction. And so they would do a round and then we would say, okay, you're first, you're second, you're third, here's the next question. And then we would re-rank them and keep yeah. dropping off the low one till we had leveraged tens of millions of dollars in savings for the taxpayers of the state of Connecticut. You know, that's my job. So right. why wouldn't you let me do that for, you know, a person running a mom and pop business, you know, in Canton or Avon? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I will say, you know, there were multiple prescription bills that were before the legislative session in 2019. Now, obviously, we've had a disjointed year this year. And, you know, it, there's, there's no going back, even with the special session coming up next week. But um, there was, you know, especially, I believe there was one that was in regard to uh, prescriptions from um, prescription drugs from Canada. And, that was a that was a no vote by my opponent, and I you know I, I I know that there are always explanations for why you vote against a bill, but when it comes to saving people money, I mean I do a lot of work with food insecure people, and the, and one of the number one things that I hear, or I should say the number one thing that I hear is. There are months I am deciding between my food and my medicine, or I'm deciding between my food and my rent or my food and my mortgage, whatever it might be. And, you know, food is one avenue to health and medicine is an avenue to health for many people who cannot just, you know, eat their way healthy. Um, and so it really is astonishing that you would have these options and someone would vote against them because a lobbyist is saying, well, you know, <laughs> it's so I so I'm grateful that you are in the position you're in both to save the taxpayer money and also to save. Yeah, maybe stuff. not. I, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I wonder sometimes if these same I wonder sometimes if these folks have ever experienced a moment in their lives, either growing up or now as adults, right. where that to me the choice you just talked about. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I can only say for me, like I remember my stepfather was a small business owner. I remember him being injured on the job. I remember him needing surgery to fix the injury. And I remember them sitting at the kitchen table with that Blue Cross Blue Shield bill knowing they could not pay it. Yeah. And I knew what happened. Yep. And it, what it ended up being was like food stamps and payment plans and a whole bunch of things. Um, uh, so you don't have to necessarily live through something like that to empathize. 
But, right. you know, do more than that, right? That's too bad is not a public policy. You know, what are you going to do? So no is not an option. No, right. but this instead, um, right. bring it on. I want to hear yeah. all about it. And I love the fact that the governor has said the same thing. He said, bring me your ideas. Like, we want to hear what you have to say. I have always operated that this way. But when yeah. you're dealing with people who just say no and have nothing to offer except the talking points that were handed to them by Big Pharma or by the insurance mm -hmm. industry, and they read from them literally on the House right. floor, like, what do you do about that? That's the best representation we can shake up in a state like Connecticut? Yeah. Well, and it's interesting. It, and that sort of leads me to our next point in terms of budget and bonding. And, our, and we had a bond hearing today. I, I, I think that, you know, something I say frequently is that you don't have to have had it happen to you to recognize an injustice and to do something about it. And in terms of these ideas, I feel strongly that the, it doesn't need to be a Republican idea or a Democratic idea. I don't really care. I'm like you are. I don't care where the idea comes from. I don't, you know, and I, the way I look at all of them, I, my idea is always, let's take two ideas and synthesize them because this one isn't perfect and this one isn't perfect, but there is something in the middle that's magical. And if we can get to that mm -hmm. point and we can really move forward with those kinds of ideas, that's critically important. So as I said to you, as we were sort of warming up, how lucky are we that you had a bond meeting today and it was the first one since I believe April. So yeah. it's, I, if you wanna to speak to some of the things that were voted on today or just some of the things in terms of budget forecasting, because you know, unless somebody has a crystal ball, you know, we have so many things up in the air right now, not not just what's going on here, but federally. So whatever you would like to speak to in terms of where we are right now and where we might be. So, uh, <laughs> where we might be, right. Yeah. Fingers crossed, I hope. Yes. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll confess at the beginning of this that the least my least favorite part of the job that I do and I love my job is the bond commission um, because these are really heady and important decisions right because we're putting things on the credit card right we are right. buying things uh, that are there to support infrastructure and education and do all the things that we know need mm -hmm. to happen uh, but for so long Connecticut um, had put uh, items on the bond agenda that didn't live beyond the life of the bond, right? So when you're doing roads and bridges and infrastructure, you know, long after we pay that off, those things are going to, if they're well-maintained, are going to be right. there. Um, the Lamont administration has been much, much better, much more restrained in the way they use the bond agenda. So, so that's helpful. Um, we passed, you know, quite a few items today, 36, if I remember correctly, um, but a lot of them were about you know, buildings that had uh, suffered from deferred maintenance. These are our assets that have not been maintained. They need to be maintained, otherwise they become zero value assets. Um, what do we do about schools that can't wait? Either they're busting at the seams because they have too many kids or their kids are being educated in an environment that none of us would want to see our child uh, right. educated in. So um, it was a combination of things. Um, and then also how do we cautiously inject uh, capital into the market for those micro businesses, for example, for right. minority owned or women owned businesses that while sort of the private sector has been a little bit better lately about lending uh, to yes. them, um, now everything has sort of you know shut down. That's really the cornerstone of our success, our innovation. And you probably know or saw that Bloomberg called Connecticut. Yep fourth most innovative state in mm -hmm. the country. And, well, and we're the best state for women entrepreneurs. Yes, so. <laughs> absolutely right. Absolutely right. Yep. Um, so when, when I just a little sort of sidetrack here, when I think about the three things we have going for us right now, you know, our COVID numbers are incredibly low and right. that's not by accident, right? Mm -hmm. It's really thoughtful public health and policy yep. intervention and a citizenry, a group of people who live here who are willing to more often than not, wear their mask, be smart, right. don't be knuckleheads, right? No, your constitution doesn't protect you from having a mask on. You know, this is a public health emergency. Do what you're supposed to do. The, the second piece is that we've got a rainy day fund, a budget reserve fund that hovers right around 2.5, 2.6 billion dollars. So we've set aside money for this day or days like right. this. And I'm happy to tell you how that happened if you want to talk about it later. I do. And then, <laughs> and then that Bloomberg piece, yeah. right, innovation. I'll take being the fourth most innovative state over being the number one employment state any right. day of the year because innovation right. is about future growth. The other stuff is just 
woman yep. and today you're the peacock tomorrow you're the feather duster <laughs> absolutely so with the bond meeting today it was interesting because i i was able to listen to most of it on ctn and for um people watching tonight you know that's the great thing about ctn when you want to hear these hearings especially these special legislative ones and especially under the circumstances that we find ourselves the best way for you to do that is i i literally just logged on to ctn today and hit play and heard you and sean and and some of our um you know the other members of of the bond committee um it's interesting too i was i was reading an article a few days ago about where we are in terms of borrowing. I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit about our percentage and how that looks and, and where we're headed with in terms of that. Yeah, you know, Sean, and I know you met with him last week yes. on, the on Tuesday, um, is really great about that piece because he's really in charge of going to the market and getting the money and figuring out where we are um, under the right. bond cap. Um, but I'll say for, for my purposes, you know, my job is he, he's money in, I'm money out. So <laughs> I'm always like buying stuff and paying right. bills and paying people. Right. Um, but this balance and the check and balance system that we have going on right. uh, um, is pretty awesome. Um, we are well below the threshold holds that have been set we uh, will remain there and when and if it looks like things are getting a little bit out of balance and we're getting too close the yes. administration will back and we will have to either cancel or uh, slow down uh, right. certain uh, items that are on the agenda um, and it's sort of interesting politically at the capitol to watch because people who will rail against bonding do so um, except when it has uh, something on it for their community or for something that they care deeply about. Right. And in that case, the governor's a hero and thanks for putting this on the agenda and you're a great guy. Um, so, you know, it doesn't, you know, there's 169 towns and many, 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 many more interests. Um, uh, so you've got to balance uh, all of that. Um, the budget itself, Eleni, is, you know, it struggles. You know, I projected last month, as I do on the first of every month, that would be at about a $445 million budget deficit for the fiscal year that closed June 30th. Right. Um, that number has since improved. Um, and OPM put out a number on the 20th of about 190 because additional federal dollars came in and refunds for taxes uh, right. weren't going out at the level that they thought they would. So that's all good news. Um, but we're still in a very precarious position, right? When you lose 50% of the leisure and hospitality jobs overnight. Right. During the Great Recession, we lost you know, a similar number of jobs, but it was over a nine month period of time. Right. So when you look at the right. graph, it's sort of slow burn, but it's bad. With this COVID thing, it went like from here down. And so we joke in the office, joke in the office that, you know, we applied the brakes, but we had to hit them so hard that we went through the windshield. This is really yes. bad um, and uncharted territory. I feel like I say that every day, like we just don't know right what the recovery is going to look like. So we have to be super cautious. Um, dare I say even a little conservative in our decision making around mm -hmm. how we're going to uh, plot a, a course forward. Um, but, but we've been through this before. You know, we, can, we, can, we can do this. We just have to um, be thoughtful um, and apply some of that Yankee ingenuity we love to uh, uh, talk about so much. Well, and I think in some ways it is what we've already been through and in terms of, you know, maybe not exactly, but, you know, 2008 was not that long ago. And I think that when we're looking in terms of that, I mean, we are obviously still seeing, you know, the unemployment numbers were, are not great. The ones that I just saw, you know, we're still serving 1400 people a day at food share at Rentschler Field, which is in addition to all the other work that we do. Um, so, you know, it is, you know, people really are still struggling and not everybody's back. I think as I was sharing some of the information in terms of, the, the um, top three categories of people that were laid off. I think people were surprised that healthcare workers, I believe was number two. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's shocking because that even included doctors. But when you look at the number of elective procedures that had been pulled back, you know, I don't care who you are. I don't care what a good saver you are or how, um, you know, that you're, you're really good in terms of budgeting your house. When you lose two thirds of your salary, it, it's, it is, you know, consequential, to say the Absolutely least. Absolutely dev devastating. For yeah, dev and, and devastating in a lot of cases. And that's when, you know, you find all, all of these other situations. Again, I think that we do have things in place that help our resiliency. And I would love for you actually to speak to that rainy day fund, because honestly, I can't think of another situation in which we 
have the pouring that we do now, <laughs> the pouring rain. Um, and so I, I think that a lot of people don't understand the history of that. And thank God, all I can say is thank God that we didn't dip into that last year because look where we'd be now had we dipped into that during last year's legislative session, like some people had wanted us to. Right. So. Absolutely. If you want, yeah. Absolutely. And, and it, 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 so the, the, the rainy day fund, the budget reserve fund, um, we, you know, we put money away um, just for these rainy days. Uh, but for years, Connecticut was terrible at doing this. You know, they would certify a surplus at the end of the fiscal year after everybody got their little piece of the pie at the end. It was really sort of gross. You know, they'd pick over the carcass, everybody would take a little bit. And then whatever small number was left, they'd say, okay, we'll put this in the savings account. In 2015, I went up to the legislature and asked them to apply a little of fourth grade economics to the way they do budgeting. Um, and that's something that our parents often told us when we would get like a $10 check from grandma for our birthdays or something. They would say something like, you can spend half, but you have to save half. Um, and mm -hmm. so we applied that to one-time revenue, right? Dollars that came in above what we anticipated. There's a run on Wall Street and suddenly there's a bunch of money coming in or something else happened mm -hmm. and there's one-time one -time money coming in that you don't build budgets around going forward. We said, capture those dollars, set them aside. And I have to say the finance committee at that time, Republicans and Democrats alike, all voted in favor of this concept, even though it meant that they were gonna tie their hands a little bit. Right. Um, they knew for different reasons that they wanted to do this. They didn't wanna talk about tax increases at the worst possible time. They didn't wanna talk about cutting safety at the worst possible time. So right. when you have that money, you, you can do that. So fast forward, we went from couple hundred million dollars to 2.65 I think it will be at the end uh, of this year so we're going to lean hard on that not just to cover any deficit that's there this year uh, but I anticipate there'll be you know a significant deficit next year unless there's a complete dynamic turnaround that seems unlikely uh, and fast um, so that puts us in a in a really strong position uh, but it's boring right when, when you talk about it as look at this important public policy you know, people are like, they glaze over, or to your point earlier, in bad times, or when nonprofits, for example, hadn't seen an increase in the dollars they received from the state right. for years and years in some cases, um, they had a really valid argument to touch some of that money to help sort of keep th them going, um, because nonprofits are providing a, a vital resource, mm -hmm. and in they're doing stuff that they would other ourselves have to do work that they do. Right. Um, the governor was right to say no. And I hope I was right to say no when they came, not because there was any joy in that, um, but because that's not what the rainy day fund is for. Um, and now we don't need it. And it probably means that those same nonprofits won't see further cuts in the short term because we've got the dollars to, to support us. Well, and it is, I mean, it is scary. I don't care what nonprofit you're running, what nonprofit you work for. I mean, it certainly is scary because the need is so great. Um, you know, just as, as someone who talks to a lot of other fo folks who work in nonprofit, I mean, we see it regularly. Um, and then in addition, you know, it was interesting. I was having a conversation you, you mentioned in terms of managing the pensions and um, teacher pensions, I believe, fall under there. And so we have a lot of conversations across our state about teacher pensions, about the CBAC agreement, you know, uh, what our what our responsibility is to people. You know, I've had people say to me, well, I don't have a pension. Why should they still have a pension? Because, you know, times are tough and things have changed and this and that. So I, I wonder if you could just speak a little bit to pension management and where we are now because progress has been made um, in terms of debt. And so I, I just would love for you to speak to that because I know a lot of people think about that. And you explain things so um, in a way that is digestible for a lot of people. <laughs> I hope I don't oversimplify, but, no, no. but you know, the goal is always to sort of, you know, yes. uh, explain these important concepts because, you know, top line, you're right. You, you knock on a door and you talk to someone who's either struggling in retirement or, you know, has a 401k that they've underinvested to and now watch the market drop out in some cases and feel really vulnerable. Right. So right. The, the first instinct for humans often is to say, I'm feeling super vulnerable here. What about them? 
Like, why do right. they have and I don't? So it's that us versus them thing. The mm -hmm. history of, you know, the defined benefit pension system needs an hour by itself. Right. But a lot of these pensions were put in place uh, because at that time, salaries inside state government were not what they were in the private sector. There was a large group of negotiators that got to that point. Um, and over time, there had been layering um, of sort of what the benefit looks like, and then it got scaled back. And so really the seminal moment for Connecticut's pension system uh, what goes back to when John Rowland was governor. Uh, and there was a moment where despite the fact that we were turning out record surpluses, that's among the years where some of us got like a check back from the state, right. we were signed. We were, uh, folks wanted to know they were sending you back money. Um, at that time, went back to negotiate with labor and took the payment that was supposed to be made in those years during his administration and essentially renegotiated the amortization, like on your mortgage, the time it was going to pay off, took his payment down, but put us on a balloon mortgage. And so yeah. you, it was <laughs> which low people and don't slow, understand. <laughs> yes. right, which is like crazy. So it was low and slow over time and go to the comptroller's website and all this stuff is there, not in a partisan way, but just sort of fact based year by year what happened. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly that number started to grow at hundreds of thousands of hundreds of millions of dollars per year. And yeah, it started to crowd out other things. But that wasn't the fault of the workers, right, who, who had these pensions. They had met often no say. It was irresponsible elected officials mm -hmm. um, that did this and created a crisis. Uh, so uh, Governor Malloy was in charge at the time. Uh, he and I didn't always see eye to eye, but um, you know, we had a plan um, and he had a plan. And ultimately, uh, labor and the legislature got together and uh, they negotiated a change that flattened that number out without doing a major kick the can down the road thing, because that's also too easy to do. Oh. But when you have a huge debt, when you have a huge obligation like that, that you can't get out from under two options, right? One is uh, to put it underneath something and make believe it's not there. And right. Connecticut tried that for a long time. Um, or if you can't make it disappear, which we would all love the liability to just disappear, right. you need to make it flat and predictable. You can't have like all of this because mm -hmm. it's impossible to budget when those numbers are going the way they're going. So the changes that were made make that flat and predictable over time. And you hope always with growth in the right. economy, and we were experiencing that before COVID hit, that that number would actually become a smaller percentage of the right. whole. It doesn't mean it's a small number, it's a big number, um, but then you can plan uh, around it. Um, and then there are other things you can do around one-time payments or you know, figuring out what you do with surplus assets that we really don't need anymore. Are they better off being liquidated and then those dollars being turned to the pension fund? Um, right. It makes no sense in my mind to turn uh, what have we got? 50,000 employees and about the same number of retirees. To take 50,000 employees and throw them out in the 401k market just because private employers a long time ago realized I, they wanted to get out from under the long term yeah. liability. And the way they did that was to push people to these DC pr plans. And then it's not like you go back to them when your money runs out and say, hey, Continental can, I'm out of money, what do I do? They're like, you know, hit the bricks, you know, you had your money, you know, it's up to you to figure out what right. to do. Um, what does that do to a state when a large portion of their population ends up retiring in poverty or slips into poverty? Right. Well, government has to step back up. So we have a vested interest in trying to make sure not only that our retirees live, you know, some middle class yeah. level of, of retirement, uh, but that more people have access to some sort of saving vehicle. Uh, I will be comptroller at the end of this term for 12 years. This is my third term, which makes my head hurt. I can't believe I don't know when it happened. <laughs> But my pension, my salary is $110,000 by statute. I'm happy to tell you that, or you could look it up. My pension after 25 years of service inside state government will be something like $2,800 a month. Now, that's I'm so glad that you did that exact math for us because <laughs> I think there is a fallacy that is pervasive and persistent that people are retiring at these extraordinary, you know, these rates. And while I understand that compared to people who do not have a defined benefit pension, it does seem extraordinary. 
Absolutely. But, you know, again, it was the corporations that pushed off. And, and so it's, thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, the, there may be another solution. I just haven't heard one that really makes sense to me. The solutions I've heard are all driven by the financial services industry. And what they see is load on investment and money they can be pulling into their coffers versus get, putting the hand, money in the hands of someone like Sean Wooden, who is able to invest those dollars um, at very, very low rates. Um, and well, and I would say, and grateful. <laughs> we were watching Too Big to Fail again for the millionth time the other night. And while that's not about retirement, um, I think that when you look at that and about the, the mortgages and lending money to people who were not good lenders and the assumptions on, you know, everybody thought that, oh, that money was still being lended to these, you know, sterling folks that were going to not have you know, default issues, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I just think about, if we were to once again, you know, it, it, you, you're right. You don't want people retiring in poverty. And frankly, it's not good for the economy because all the dollars that they would be spending in the economy are not being put back into the economy. So there's no injection of that. I, I think that, you know, there, there's certainly smarter brains than mine when it comes to economic policy. That is, you know, not the, <laughs> but, but I will say it's, it's, it's kind of like you said about the, when you get the $10 from grandma, you know, you do have to balance out a lot of those, those, you know, wants versus needs. And, and in our house, it was always, you know, you keep some to spend and then part of it's savings and part of it is donation. So, um, yeah, because right. when much is given, much is expected. I say it a lot, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. you know, so I, I think that there, you know, there is, a, there is a lot around that. So I thank you so much for going into that because I do think that there are a lot of uh, misconceptions around that. And so it's important to have just sort of the, the basic bones and, and the skinny on that, because, you know, there are a lot of things we'd like to be able to do, but we cannot just spend, we can't put it on the credit card, as you said, and I am not a fan of kicking it down the road either, because that's going to be our children's or our grandchildren's problem. And that's, that's not great either. So I think that it's, it's nice to hear some of these sort of wise things, both the rainy day fund and the thoughtfulness behind, you know, we may have to put the brakes on some things that right now we're thinking we would like to be able to do. So I thank you for it's, all of this. It's, it's not sexy, but it's probably it the not. most important things we can right. be doing to, as you point out, really leave this state in a better condition than we found it. We Absolutely. got it broken. And right. so now putting it back on track is slow, methodical, right. and cheering, rooting for failure from the sidelines. No. You know, that's, you know, th there's a... Right special ring in hell, I think, for people who, who do stuff like that, where we, we have a real challenge in front of us and we've got the, the ability uh, to fix it. So on pensions, I'll just point folks, we've done a lot of work around transparency in mm -hmm. the budget, in the checkbook, in the payroll, in the retirement, all right. that's available on the Comptroller's website. The reason people believe, well, though, look at hundreds of thousands of dollars these pensioners are getting is because the newspaper reports it's not interesting to report $2,800 a month. That's not interesting. But the former brain surgeon at UConn Health Center who is drawing down a big pension, that's interesting, right? Now, in some cases, we may be giving the wrong amounts of salary to the wrong people. I'll set that aside for a second. But you know, those are the exceptions, not the rule. And the tiers, the, the benefit, the richness of the benefit has been negotiated down year over year to the point now we have a, a tier four Right. I hope I got that right. Uh, pension system that really is a hybrid. It's got a little defined benefit, uh, but it's got a bigger defined compensation piece. And, and that sort of allows for our young sort of tech folks, for example, that I hire a lot of because I neglected to say I run the core financial system, which is the big fiscal blinking heart of the state. It makes it easier for me to hire those folks because they know when they leave, even if they're not vested, they go with some 401k style savings account to their next employer. So um, don't, you know, don't believe me, go look online, search, look up your neighbor, do whatever you want to do. You, it's all public information and, and it's all there. And I think uh, you don't get to have your own facts in these conversations. No, and transparency is so important. And I, I have to say, you know, as we're sort of closing out, first of all, thank you again so much for being here. This was absolutely fantastic. I also would say that, you know, I feel like you are leaving us with um, hope, which is, you know, people say, oh, hope, you know, it does, it really does matter because to me, hope is what gets you to a plan. You know, it's, it's not that, you know, there was a, 
there was a candidate a long, you know, a while back, hope you change your stuff. How's that working out for you? But if you don't have the hope to get out of bed and make a plan and, you know, move forward, it really is critical. And so that's what I think that, you know, some of what you've said tonight, you know, it's not all doom and gloom. You know, we do have a lot of unknowns, but that doesn't mean that we cannot be hopeful about where Connecticut is going. And Connecticut's great, but we can sure make it better. And we can make it better for more Absolutely. people. That's that's the key. So um, and and so I, I really appreciate this tonight. This was great. Any closing thoughts? <laughs> no. Look, I just I just want to say thank you. This is fun doing these, uh, and I'm glad you did it. And I'm glad you're talking to a whole bunch of folks and and bringing us, you know, to your neighbors, your, your constituents. Yes. Um, and I'll just, you know, look, you're an impressive person, um, and we need more people like you at the Capitol. Um, you know, often the Capitol, because it's a citizen legislature, gets filled up with people who can afford to be there, right? Who are either retired or independently wealthy or have law practices that they can sort of float in and out of. Um, we need people who represent the spectrum of the residents of the state of Connecticut. Um, and, and you would be an amazing uh, part of that. So um, I hope so folks who are listening really think uh, long and hard. Uh, about what they're going to do in the upcoming election, and I hope they'll support you. Thanks, and and we are so close. It, you know, it's it's funny. It's um, we're really getting down to you know. You look at today, like you know, the primary is the presidential primary is not that far away. And man, once that once that happens, it is a rapid it is a rapid pace. And I it is um, certainly challenging because we're not knocking doors. But that's why these conversations I think have been so great. We're going to have all of them eventually up on the website. They all do live on Facebook so that people can access them at their leisure. And we've had people really go back um, on some of the ones because we talked to uh, Representative Johanna Hayes. I, like I said, we talked to Sean. We've talked to a therapist about quarantine fatigue. We, you know, we've had a variety of topics and we have even more folks. I could use about. that, I think. I will tell you, it was really good about, you know, family quarantine fatigue because I think that, you know, even people who say, oh, we're doing so well, there is a level of stress that's sort of this hum in the background that people um, need to acknowledge in terms of whatever self-care looks like for them. And um, it's, you know, and that is intersectional, that is, you know, across the board. So we're just hoping that people are taking care of themselves because it's a difficult time. It really is. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you again. And um, we're going to sign off for you. now. And uh, I will point people to you if they have any other questions. But this it's great to see you. And I, I'm glad your family's doing well. So thanks again. Yep. You too. Take care. You too.